What are we doing to protect our kids? What are we doing to protect the next generation? Because we've seen the way this world it goes. It just goes from evil to evil to evil. But as we're in this book, we can see that with that evil, there's this same God that was there for Jeremiah. I will pray, and then we're going to jump into Jeremiah chapter 10 and 11 tonight. Ah, but Father God, Lord, we come before you and we, Lord, we thank you. Ah, God, as we look at the craziness that is going on in this world, Lord, the, the, the sadness, the hurt, Lord, the, the sin that is just running rampant in our world today, that we can just take time out in the middle of the week, Lord, come and be refreshed by your word, Lord, having your Holy Spirit speak to us, Lord. So God, I pray that Lord, that you will just step me out of the way, Lord, and the words that, that flow from, from your word, God, your everlasting truth, Lord, will just fill this place tonight, Lord. We just thank you that we can come here together and just sing praises and song and worship you, Father, and then come and study your word, Lord. This is your story, your history, Lord, that, that we have so that we do not repeat it in our future. And as we're going through this book of Jeremiah, Lord, how prevalent it is to our world today, Lord. So just, just be with us. Lead us, guide us, Lord. Be our strength in these difficult times. We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, you know, as I was ending that prayer, I've been going through uh, the next few chapters that we're going to be hitting in Jeremiah, and what, what a resemblance that we see of Jeremiah's time and we see of our times today. As we're going through it, we're seeing that the, the shepherds, the leaders, the rulers of Judah were, were, were wicked people. You know, they were into idolatries. They were the ones that are supposed to be seeking the Lord, praising God, you know, and seeking wisdom and guidance on how to lead the people. And then we look at our nation. We look at our world today, and all we see is chaos. We see hurt. We see trauma. I had somebody speaking to me on, on Sunday, and they were saying, you know what, what was, is the definition of World War III? You know, we, we know what World War I is, we know what World War II is, and you know, and a lot of European nations fighting, and then we got involved. But when we look at our world today, you know, it says, the Bible says that in the last time there'll be wars and rumors of wars. You know, we see the, the stuff going on in Ukraine. We see the things that are going on in the Middle East, all of the, the nations that are, that are bombing and shooting rockets at Israel. We see what's going on with China and Taiwan and just the different things going all over the world today. You know, like how much more conflict do we need before it's World War III? Does it wait until the United States is involved and then they call it World War III? Or what? You know, we see all this sin. We see all of these worldly leaders, but we don't see any of them seeking God, seeking his wisdom, seeking how he should be leading. And as we drop down into chapter 10 at the bottom of it and enter chapter 11, it's going to be talking about, you know, the leaders of the world. And we should be praying for all of those that are in authority. And as we're coming into an election year, you know, be, be praying for that, for, for our state, for our local leaders, and for um, our national government as well. But let's see what Jeremiah had to say in this time many years ago. In chapter 10, he starts off, once again, it says, Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. So once again, Jeremiah is coming to them with another message. You know, over and over, we're hearing this repetitive theme in Jeremiah. This is a word from the Lord. He's coming to Judah. He's coming to the people of Israel, and he's showing them you know, how much patience Jeremiah has as a man. I know um, if we were to have to tell somebody over and over and over and over again the same message, we'd be like, you know what, this guy is hard-headed, they're not listening, you know, I'm going to move on. But here Jeremiah is, you know, continuing to come, even though he's watching all of the wickedness that's taking place in his land, in, the, in God's land, in the land of Judah. And in verse 2 he says, Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. You know, as we're, we're looking at this, we're thinking the Gentiles. Those are people that are, are not the Jews. Those are people that were not following God. And he's saying, do not be dismayed like they are at the signs of heaven. 
And you know what? We, we live in this world. We have you know, beautiful stars, sunset, sunrises out here. And we look at these words and we see how Satan, who is the god of this world, who, who tries to, he is a liar. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a liar. He tries to deceive people, you know, the things that God has created. He tries to put a twist and a spin on it. And here he's saying, you know, do not be dismayed by the signs of heaven. But when we study in Genesis, you know, God says that he has appointed, you know, he created the stars, the, the moon and the sun for, for times and seasons. But the Gentiles weren't looking at them for times and seasons, you know, to create their calendar. We see Christopher Columbus and all of these guys when they were out sailing, you know, they used the stars as their map. But these ones were looking at it more for astrology when they had eclipses or meteor showers or shooting stars. You know, they were thinking they were getting power and wisdom from the gods of the sky. And here Jeremiah, the Lord telling them, do not be dismayed looking for signs in the heaven like the Gentiles do, because we know that God created those for certain things, but not for like astrology uses and horoscope things to be telling us our future and the things that are going to happen. Those are the things for people who don't believe in God. And in verse 3, it says, For the customs of the people are fruitful. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of his workmanship with an axe. They decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with a nail and a hammer so that it won't topple. They are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor could they do any good. So he's like, you know, they, here they are. They're looking at their neighbors as they're worshiping the stuff in the sky. They're looking at their neighbors as they're worshiping things that they can carve out of wood. You know, they're going out to the forest. They're chopping this thing down with, with an ax. Then they're creating some kind of shape out of it. They're decorating it with the finest gold and silver. And then it says, you know, they got to get their hammer and their nails. They need to build a stand or something on it so that it won't fall over. And then he's saying, you know what, if you need to move it, you're going to have to pick it up. You're going to have to move it. You're going to have to carry it. And they're using this thing to be their God. You know, how strange is it that, you know, if I'm, I'm going to be praying to something, I'm going to worship something that's supposed to protect me, that's supposed to give me wisdom or give me guidance is, I need to go to the forest. I need to chop it down. I need to create it. I need to decorate it. I need to carry it and move it. Like, what kind of God is that if we have to do all the work? You know, we're creating it. We're doing that. But as they're doing it, God's telling them, you know what? Don't worry about those things. They can't do evil, but neither can they do any good. But when we look at these verses, it kind of sounds a little bit similar to something that we do out here every December. You know, maybe some of you guys drive up in the mountains, go down and cut your own tree up bring it to your house, put it on a stand, decorate it with lights and tinsels, and it sounds like a Christmas tree. But when we listen at these verses and we listen to what God has said about what these guys were doing with their idols and how, how we look at a Christmas tree today, there's some similarities, but there's a lot of differences. And you know what the difference is, is for one, you know, he was talking to don't do like the Gentiles. You know, they went out, they created these tree to be their God. You know, we come out and we get a Christmas tree to be a decoration. So for one, we're believers. We're not Gentiles looking for a God to praise. We're going out and we're finding something to help decorate our house for the, the season of Christmas time. You know, ours is something that we're doing in celebration of God's gift of Jesus to us. The Gentiles were going and getting this tree and making a, a replica, something they can do instead of God. And then he also talked about, you know, them doing it from borrowing customs of the non-believers, whereas we are believers. We're not seeking and borrowing things of something else. And Jeremiah spoke of the tree as an idol. You know, hopefully, if you guys do bow down and worship your Christmas tree, maybe that's something you shouldn't have in your house. But we don't get it as an idol. We just do it, you know, to, well, nowadays, most of them are fake. But, you know, you get that real tree in there. And for that month of December, you just got that, that smell, you know, that great Christmas tree smell. And when Jeremiah was speaking, it was a time in history when the trees were often directed um, towards idolatry. You know, the decorations and stuff they were putting on there, the gold and silver, they weren't like the Christmas balls that we have today. They were something that were geared towards the pagan religions of that time. So if you guys want a Christmas tree, that's great. If you don't, you don't have to have one. In verse 6, it says, Inasmuch 
There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nation? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is worthless doctrine. A silver beaten into plates, it is brought from Tarshish and gold from Upaz. The work of the craftsmen and the hands of the metalsmith. Blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting God. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. You know what? There is no God like our God. He is the king of kings. He is the ruler of all things here on this earth. But here we got so many people in this book, in our world today, that are looking for different kings. They're looking for wise men. They're looking to the celebrities of this, of this world, whether they be TV stars, movie stars, even athletes today that people are praising. They're idolizing them when we have the one true God, the Alpha, the Omega, the Great I Am, the first and the last. But he's talking about, you know, these times of days where people are being foolish. They're trying to create their own idols. They're beating the silver. They're beating the gold because they're trying to create this void that we all have. You know, we were created beings. We were created by a God who wanted a relationship with us. We were created with this thing to, to worship. You know, before we came to Christ, before we were walking with the Lord, you know, maybe it was our job, you know, the love of money, the cars, the women, the men, whatever it is that we were into, there was something that we were striving for to fill that void that could only be filled by God. And we're even seeing back then, you know, they're, they're praising, they're worshiping these man-made little things. The things that we have today are not much different. They may not look like a little sculpture that we have in our house, but we have other things that come in between us and the Lord. Verse 11 says, Thus you shall say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. You know, cool thing about this, I don't know if you guys have, have study Bibles or something when you look into this. This is the only verse in the book of Jeremiah that was written in Aramaic. And I was looking at some of the different commentaries, like, you know, why would God put Aramaic in this? You know, he, he's written it in, in Hebrew, and then he comes to this one little section, and he puts in a, a little segment that is in Hebrew. And it says more than likely that that was, you know, the language that people from around those nations knew. And as they don't understand Hebrew, they could still hear what Jeremiah was saying about worshiping their little idols in their own language. In verse 12, he says, He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom. And he has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there's a multitude of waters in the heavens. And he causes the vapors to ascend from the end of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Now, when we go to the very beginning of this book, Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as you drop down a couple more days later on the third day, when he's talking about, you know, this earth was spoke out of his mouth into existence, but it was without form, it was out void, and then there was water on it, and then he created the firmament. He has this earth. He said he separates the waters. We had water, liquid form, here on the ground, and then the vapor up in the air, and that, that, that vapor helped protect them from the, you know, the UV rays, all of the different things before the flood, and then after the flood, we had all the chaos, all the different storms, the lightning and the stuff that he created. You know, we see God's faithfulness. We can look into Genesis and we see the faithfulness of Noah. You know, God told him, hey, I'm going to bring judgment. Noah lived a life similar to Jeremiah. He was going out and preaching to everybody, you know, judgment's coming. We need to repent. And then they're seeing this guy out here building this big old giant boat. They're like, why would anybody build a big giant boat when we're living in this paradise? You know, they didn't have any rain. They didn't have any storms. They probably had no idea what you would use a boat for. And they come around, they listen to Noah preaching that, hey, repentance is coming because judgment is coming. 
and they see this boat, but we see Noah being obedient, and we also see God's faithfulness. He told Noah, build this, bring your family in it, and I will protect them. Just as Jeremiah is coming to his people. You know, if we repent, if we turn back, God's going to protect us. But you know what? In the end, they're not going to repent. They're not going to listen. It says in verse 14, everyone is dull-hearted. They're without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image, for his molded image is falsehood, and there's no breath in them. They are brutal, a work of heirs. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name, the coming captivity of Judah. You know, not only were they creating idols, but I don't know if any of you guys have taken ceramics, or if you guys weld, or if you build things with your hands. You know, we're people. Everything that we build, you know, as we're practicing and doing stuff, they have flaws. You know, maybe they're creating this little idol, and they, they put a little scratch by the ear or something. You know, he's saying that all of these things that you're trusting in men to break, you know, they have errors. They're false. They're going to perish. But this portion of Jacob is referring to the Lord. He is the coming captivity that will be brought judgment upon Judah to remind them who is the true God. And then in verse 17, he says, gather up your wares from the land, O inhabitants of the fortress. For this says the Lord, behold, I will throw out at this time the inhabitants of the land, and I will distress them that they might find it. You know, Jeremiah has prophetically saw, you know, God giving him vision to go out and tell the people what's going on. And he saw the Babylonians coming as an instrument of God's judgment. And he warned him, you guys are going to need to pack up quick because they're going to come in lightning fast like a slingshot and take you into captivity out of your own land. But then we see his heart. Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, woe is me for my hurt. My wound is severe, but I say truly this is an infirmity and I must bear it. My tent has plundered and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me and they are no more. There is no one to pinch my tent anymore or set up my curtains. You know, he's praying to God. He's feeling the anguish. You know, he was an emotional guy. He was in touch with his feelings because not only did he care about God. He cared about God's people. He cared about the land. You know, he said, my children have gone far from me. They're going to be no more. They're going to be taken into captive. They're going to be in despair. They're going to be in shock. They're going to be lonely. And Jeremiah felt that burden. He felt that pain. And then he comes on talking about the shepherds and the leaders. And he says, for the shepherds have become dull hearted. They have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all of their flocks shall be shattered. Behold, the noise of the report has come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of jackals. So now he's coming and saying that, you know, the shepherds, all of the priests, all of the leaders that were supposed to, you know, be there to encourage the people to walk in righteousness. Instead, these guys were preaching peace, peace. And Jeremiah's out here saying, you know, judgment's coming. They're thinking, all right, these guys are telling us we got peace. We can continue doing all this idolatry, all of this evil wickedness, but we got peace. So we don't have to worry about what Jeremiah is saying. And the Lord saying, you know, all of your shepherds, all of your leaders have been following wickedness. You know, they were supposed to be the one giving them good counsel. They were the ones supposed to be teaching them the word of the Lord, God's way. But instead, they were worried about themselves. How can we be financially viable? You know, we can't be making a profit if we're preaching doom and gloom, but if we bring peace, you know, they're going to be coming to the altars. They're going to be coming, doing all of their idolatry and paying the way as they do it. So they were like, you know what? This is not the way to do it. But even in our personal life, you know, we need to be careful who we have as shepherds above us because we have a God in heaven that loves us. You know, he wants a relationship with us. He's what they call in the Bible. It says he's our good, good father. And then the other day, I was outside walking, walking my dog, and we have a neighbor, and they got, they got a little girl about yay big, and I'm watching him as the dad's out there walking behind him, like, what are they doing? 
And it looked like she was learning how to roller skate for the first time. So we got this dad. You see her just tenderly walking, slowly holding her hand as he's just kind of pulling her along with her roller skates. And I'm like, man, isn't that a good picture of, of what God wants to do with us? You know, as we're walking through this world, you know, so many sad things, so many hard things going on. And here he is, we got our good, good father that's just holding us and just barely three minutes along as we're learning how to skate, as we're learning how to do these things his way. So we want to make sure that, you know, the shepherds that we have over our life, you know, they're, they're speaking into God's word, that we're seeking God's word to know if we have a good shepherd or if we have one of these shepherds that were trying to lead Judah at that time. And then in verse 23, he says, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your fury on those Gentiles who do not know you and on the families who do not call you by your name. For they have eaten up Jacob. They had devoured him and consumed him and made his dwelling place desolate. As Jeremiah considered this great trauma that was about ready to come onto their land, he was praying for God, you know, take it easy on us. I know judgment's coming, but don't wipe us out. But he's like, I know that you have this just righteous anger. And Lord, you're bringing these people in to bring judgment on us. But he's like, make sure you remember them. Cast your fury upon them who deny you, who are going to come in and wipe out your land. So kind of like a catch-22. He's like, you know, our people are wicked. Our people are doing all these bad things. But take it easy on us, God. Put all your punishment upon them. And then we're going to jump down to Jeremiah chapter 11. And as we're, we're going through this chapter, we're going to be talking about, you know, the broken covenant. And as I told you guys, when we started at the beginning of this book, that Jeremiah kind of bounces around. It goes in different, different areas. And then when, when Josiah was king, he became king at eight years old when Jeremiah was in there. And as he grew a little bit older, he realized that, you know, there was a lot of wickedness going on. And he had some of his, his priests and people were rebuilding the temple and they found the, the law. They found the word of God. And that part was in Second Chronicles 34, verse 14 through 33. Um, just to give you guys an insight, I'm going to read that one real quick. We're not going to do any commentary on it, but it helps give a backdrop of the next chapter. So Second Chronicles 34, starting in verse 14, it says, While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord, and he gave it to Shaphan. And Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, your officials are doing everything that has been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord, that they have entrusted it to the supervisors and the workers. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah the priest had given me a book, and Shaphan had read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robe, and he gave orders to Hilkiah, Akin, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's attendant. Go and acquire of the Lord for me, for the remnant of Israel and Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found." Great is the Lord's anger that it poured out on us because those who have gone before us have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that was written in this book. And then it says, Hilkiah and those kings went and they sat with him and went and spoke to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Hesariah, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people. All of the curses that were written in this book that has been read in the presence of the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all that their hands have made. My anger will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words that you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God, 
when you heard what he spoke against his place and his people, and because you humbled yourself before me and you tore your robe and you wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring upon this place and on those who live here. So they took her answer back to the king. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and he went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, all of the people from the least to the greatest. He read in the hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by his pillar, and he renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decree with all the heart and all his soul and to obey the words of this covenant written in this book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. So Josiah removed all the detestable idols from the territory belonging to the Israelites, and he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God as long as he lived. They did not fail to follow the Lord, the God, the father of their ancestors. So here we see that, you know, Josiah saw all this wickedness that was going on. They brought the book of Exodus. You know, he's reading the law, the commands of what God had. And he said, you know what? All of our forefathers have been living this wicked life. He's like, I tore, he tore his robe. He, he brought man-made revival into his land because he was king. They tore down all the altars, all of the the worship to the idols, was quit. So they had like a, a mini revival. But we can see as we dig through the next chapter that it wasn't in the people's heart. As soon as Josiah died, they kind of went back to where they were before. So as we start in chapter 11, remembering how, how it was when Josiah kind of brought that revival to the land, it says, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, hear the words of this covenant and speak them to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do according to all that I command you, so shall you be my people, and I will be, my, and be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. And I answered and said, so be it, Lord. So God spoke to Judah about their failures, you know, about keeping the ancient covenant that Israel made with God at Mount Sinai in the days of Moses. And when Israel made that covenant with God, God walked with them. God brought them into this land that was flowing with milk and with honey, and he gave them the land. He took them out of Egypt and he brought them into the promised land. So he fulfilled all of his obligations to the covenant. But then we're watching as Israel got into this abundance, this great land that was given to them by God. They slowly had covetous eyes of what was going on in their neighbors. You know, they saw that they had kings. They had all this gold, all of these women that they were worshiping. And they're like, you know what? That's what we want. So in verse six, it says, then the Lord said to me, proclaim all of these words in the city of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of the covenant and do them. For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day I brought them up out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey, they did not incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done." So Jeremiah's assignment now is to go out and to read what was given to, to Moses, to show him what this covenant was, that all of the promises that God did, if you obey me, if you follow me, if you walk with me as that girl did with her dad as they were skating down the street, I will be your good father. But if you don't, all of these judgments that I said will be coming, they will be coming upon you. So early in the morning, Jeremiah is out there teaching and telling the people that this is what God wants from us. And then in verse 9, he said, And then the Lord said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
They have turned their back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I have made with their fathers. So you know what? The people had seen the promises. They heard what Jeremiah was saying, but it says, you know what? They turned back to the wickedness. They turned back to the desires of their hearts, and then they broke the covenant. They went and did what they desired, not what God had told them to do. And he said, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will surely bring calamity on them which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and they will cry out to the God to whom they offer incense. But they will not save them at that time of their trouble. For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the numbers of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. So do not pray for these people or lift up a cry or a prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. Man, they got calamity coming, and the first thing they're going to be doing is going and praying to their gods, praying to these little images that they made. You know, here they are hearing that judgment is coming from God. Judgment is coming from the one that gave them the covenant through Moses. And then when they hear that, they're going right back to these things that they made. You know, they don't have that repentive heart. They're not choosing to go back to God. It's just like sometimes in our lives, you know, we get stuck in these sins. We get stuck through, you know, we're hard-headed. We're, we're, we're no different than these people here where we just spin over and over and over in our hardness of heart. We're seeking that quick payday. We're seeking that quick high. We're seeking that quick glory that we can find when we know that God's calling us. We can hear the Holy Spirit drawing us near to him. But we're like, you know, I got this. I can do this on my own. I can do this with this little thing I created. But then God's saying, you know what? They're going to realize that that little idol, that little thing that we're trying to find to bring us happiness that, that doesn't work, whether it's the next relationship, it's the next thing that we're chasing, isn't doing what we think it's going to do. And God's saying, you know what? They're going to realize that and they're going to come back to me. And he says, you know what? I'm not even going to hear their prayer. They have rejected me. They have hardened their heart to me. And I've seen the fake revival that they had when Josiah was king. And I know as they're coming to me now that it's not true repentance. It's just coming that we're in trouble and we're going to seek whatever God we can find that will, that will save us in that day. In verse 15, he says, What has my beloved to do in my house? Having done lewd deeds with many, and the holy flesh has passed from you, when you do evil, then you rejoice. The Lord called your name, green olive tree, lovely and good fruit. With the noise of a great turmoil, he has kindled fire on it and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and for the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. You know, we, we, we look at the New Testament. We see that God looks at the church as his bride. He looked at Israel, his chosen people as his bride, and he said, my beloved, what have you done in my house, having done these lewd deeds, all of these evil things, you know, against her husband? You know, it would be the same as having, having a wife that's going out and committing adultery or having a husband that's going out and committing adultery and continuing to try to come home. And he's like, look at what you've done to me. He's like, you've gone out, and done all of these bad deeds, and when you do evil, you rejoice. You know, that is very similar to, to some of the things that are going on in our culture today, in our world today. You know, what the Bible calls sin, people are okay with it. You know, there's not a problem with you doing this or you doing that. Like, there's no truth out here anymore. You have your way, I have my way, and we can all go be happy together about it. But God's saying, you know what, I know what sin is. I know what wickedness is. And you can't just say that that is good to do. You can't go having big, big parades down the street. You can't be going out, committing all these adulterous acts. And then, you know, we don't call it sacrificing our babies the way they do. You know, they call it nicer names now that, you know, we, we terminated 
a pregnancy, but in God's eyes, there's no way to just terminate a young baby. He said, you know, you're going out and you're rejoicing in your wickedness. And he's like, I'm going to reject it. I am going to bring my anger that you provoked me on, on top of you. And then in verse 18, we see poor Jeremiah getting threatened. It says, now the Lord gave to me knowledge of it. And I know it for you showed me their doings. But I was like a docile little lamb brought to the slaughter. And I did not know that they had devised schemes against me saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit and let us cut him off from this land of the living that his name may be remembered no more. So here Jeremiah is doing everything that God told him to do. I'm going out to the temple. I'm preaching your word. I'm going and sharing the covenant that they made with Moses. And now God's telling him, you know what? You're doing all these things that I commanded you, but the people from your town are plotting against you. You know, they, they, he's walking into it like a lamb of the slaughter. You know, I'm walking through town doing all these things that God has called me to go do. And God's saying, you know what? They're coming after you. And in verse 20, he says, But, O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the minds and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for you I have revealed my cause. Like, O Lord of hosts, he's knowing that there's a threat against his life, and he did the right thing. He went to God in prayer, and he began calling God the Lord of hosts. You know, it wasn't like an idol or a tree. It's that he's like, I know that you are the creator. You're the host of all things, a title that God is the commander of heavenly armies. And he judges righteously. He's testing the mind and the heart. And Jeremiah is coming to him for protection. You know, when we're going through hard things, difficult things, we come to the Lord from protection. We come to the Lord rejoicing and praising him in the good times and the bad. And then in verse 21, it says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Antheloth, who seek your life, saying, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring catastrophe on the men of Anathoth, even the year of their punishment. We know from the beginning of Jeremiah that Anathoth was his hometown. This was his village. It was the village of priests. And here we're seeing that these priests, these villagers want to take his life. You know, the doesn't give us much degree on why he wants to take their life, but we know that as uh, they were worshiping false god, as these guys were bringing and preaching peace, and then they got this loudmouth kid over here saying, you know what, you guys need to repent, you need to turn because judgment is coming. You know, that affects their livelihood. You know, we see the same, the same thing with Jesus in his day. You know, he's out here saying, you guys need to repent. And the religious leaders are like, you know, this guy's coming in here. He's saying things that are against us. Maybe we should take him out. You know, Jesus and, and um, Jeremiah have a little bit of similarities in here and that their own towns were turning against him. But here, Jeremiah, God let him know that, hey, they're coming after you. But I told them to quit preaching against me, lest they die. And he tells them that, you know what, they're going to be killed. They're by the sword, their son, their daughters, and they should die by famine, and there will be no remnant of them. So those that were coming against God's people, he's promising to bring a particular judgment against them. And, you know, here we see Jeremiah, you know, weeping and crying for the people of Judah. And he probably had mixed feelings about this. He's like, yes, God, protect me, but Lord, why are you going to destroy all of these people in punishment. And you know what? That's a, that's a hard way to, to, to end our reading through Jeremiah. So as, as we began this, this study tonight, I was talking about the similarities that, that Jeremiah has with our time today. We see that when Josiah was king, you know, he kind of brought revival around. But then slowly he died and they went right back to where they were before. And, you know, we can kind of see from generation to generation, you know, just in our lifetime, uh, doing, you know, looking at, at what we have on TV. 
You know, how many of you guys have seen It's a Wonderful Life? Wow. More than I have. I haven't seen it yet. But I was, I was looking into it. You know, that movie was made in 1946. And, and there was a certain bad word that they put in that movie that when it came out, they stopped it. They didn't put it out to production, that they had to edit it and remove it. And you know how bad that word was that was in that movie? It was the word jerk. You know, they went to put this movie out, and he called somebody a jerk, and they took it out. But if you slowly look, okay, so we start with the word jerk, and then we go generation to generation, and then you see the stuff that we have on TV today. You know, where were the shepherds in those days? Where are, are the people in our days today that are, that are seeking God's word? You know, they're seeking the covenant that, that was made by God. You know, walk in these Ten Commandments. Walk in this way or that way. When even us as a church, you know, as we're going through this last week, we we're talking about, you know, the, the calloused heart. You know, God seeking a relationship with us. And as we go through this world and we see so much sin, so much hurt, so much trauma, you know, how calloused are we? Like, you know what? I'm standing here in church today and I said the word jerk and none of you guys were offended. But in 1946, you couldn't even put that word on TV. You know, it's slowly and slowly this world is creeping in not only to those outside of the church, but those inside of the church. You know, some of the things that should have been offensive to us, things that are offended to God, we look at them and we're like, yeah, it's just a TV show. You know, it's just a this or just a that. And we wonder why there's so much turmoil, why there's so much hurt in our world today is because as they were in Jeremiah's day, they weren't seeking God. You know, even, even the leaders, the priests, the, the people in authority were doing things that pleased them. Um, we just got back from California yesterday. We flew out real quick to go to, go to, a, to a funeral. But we were kind of joking why we were, we were in California that there was an article that came out a couple weeks ago just to show you where, where our legal system is. There was a woman that stabbed a man 108 times and she got community service. Marijuana. State of California, there was, I don't know the whole article, but she had two rips off of a bong, stabbed a guy 108 times, and they gave her community service. You know, whatever the situation was, you know, that's a lot of anger, that's a lot of rage to stab somebody that many times. You know, that would make you tired. But <laughs> our society, you know, we're, we're so callous to it, well, we'll give her community service. You know, I don't know all the legal things that were around it, but that was still another person's life. That was somebody that was created in the image of God, somebody that was loved by God and was brutally murdered. And our society went from where you can't even say the word jerk on TV, that somebody could stab somebody 118 times, or 108 times and get community service. So I just want us to go, as we're going through this book, you know, to see what is going in our heart. You know, what kind of things are we allowing in this generation that's going to be passed on to our kids being thinking that, it, that it's okay? Because, you know, if we were to go talk to our, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or whoever we known that would have been alive in 1946, I, hope, I, don't, I don't think any of you guys were alive in 1946, but maybe, if you were, but, you know, you guys see the, the slow changes, you know, like, what are we doing to protect our kids? What are we doing to protect the next generation? Because we've seen the way this world it goes, it just goes from evil to evil to evil. But as we're in this book, and the youth tonight are in the book of Revelation, we can see that with that evil, there's this same God that was there for Jeremiah. There's that same God that's here for us today, that when we're going through those struggles, when we're going through those heartaches, we know that he is like that dad that was there with his daughter with the roller skate, trying to lead us and guide us, to protect us as Jeremiah ended um, kind of brutally, but God says, you know what? I got you, Jeremiah. I got your back. You know, I want you guys to know today as we get ready to head out here that, that God's got your back. You know, if we study his word, if we follow him, he's going to lead us and he's going to guide us and he's going to protect us. Let's pray. Lord, you are our all in all, our protector, our Abba, our Abba Father, our Daddy that is just there, Lord, to lead us, to guide us. 
God, I thank you for your word. Lord, as we see your heart, Jeremiah's heart, we may come in here week in and week out and think, you know, this is kind of repetitive. But Lord, that shows your long suffering, your patience. Because God, as, as those people of Judah were, so were we. But Lord, you were patient with us. And God, you are there to lead us, guide us. And Lord, we wanna thank you for that. We wanna give you praise to your name, Lord, for who you are, our Abba Father, the one that came down and died in our place, Lord. So even all the wickedness that we have done, Lord, you look on us to be righteous. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your word and we thank you for this time together, Lord. Be with us during this week, Lord. Give us eyes and ears to see what you want us to see, Lord to be that mouth, to be your hands and feet, to encourage those that are around us that don't know you, that are going through the same hardships and troubles that we are, Lord, but to show them that there's a God in heaven that loves them, Lord, that cares for them, that will walk with them through their trials and will comfort them through their sorrows. Lord, we cannot do this without you. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys.